Uh, <clears throat> all right, so uh, we now have Ryder, who's coming up to the stage. He's a DevOps SRE consultant. He's a private pilot. He actually picked me up in his helicopter this morning, which was super dope. And uh, he's from Toronto, so give him a give him a chance. We like Toronto. They're they're a real city, even though they don't have a hockey team. And uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sorry. I I got a tease. <laughs> right, everyone. Please large round of applause. Thanks, James. I don't have a helicopter, and I cheer for the Habs. So. Uh, so my name is uh, Ryder, as James just mentioned. I am a DevOps slash site reliability engineer. Uh, before that, I was actually a full stack developer. And a long time ago before that, I learned how to fly. Uh, aviation has always been an interest of mine. Not necessarily something that I wanted to make a career out of, but I've always been interested in not only the idea of flight, but the fact that it remains one of the safest industries despite having such an inherent danger associated with it. Now, I actually find a lot of similarities between DevOps and aviation. Uh, we're both solving problems on the fly, pun intended. Uh, and we're also, uh, we have the ability to make a bad situation instantaneously better or so, so much worse. Uh, so there are a couple different tricks that we use in aviation, very simple tools uh, that help make our flights more reliable that I think we can apply to DevOps to help make uh, our systems more reliable as well. So. Say that you are flying along as a private pilot, and all of a sudden, you have an engine fire. What do you do? From a very early point in our training, we regularly rehearse um, emergency situations over and over and over to the point where it starts to get a little boring. And there's a reason that we do this. Practice makes permanent. And the idea is we practice these situations so much that when the real thing happens, we don't even know what we're doing. We just know that we need to do these specific things. Uh, now, we have emergencies in DevOps, and we even have emergency procedures, but if we're being honest with ourselves, how often do we really practice for these? And you may be saying, well, our time may be better improving the reliability of our sites, and I agree with you, but practicing these emergency situations gets us more familiar with that feeling of uncomfortability that comes with a production outage, and it also allows us to take a step back after we've completed it and say, what went right, what went wrong, and what can we do to improve it? So, practice emergency situations, that's the first one. The second is checklists. And checklists are really our bread and butter of aviation. We have them for everything, from turning the plane on, turning the plane off, landing, takeoff, et cetera, et cetera. But they all exist for one reason and one reason only, to be followed in order religiously. Now, by following a checklist, I know as a pilot that whatever situation I'm trying to make my aircraft do, as long as I followed the checklist, I'm going into it as safe as I possibly can. Uh, and by doing that, um, we actually have checklists in, uh, in DevOps as well, believe it or not. Um, the more, uh, sorry, uh, the checklists in DevOps we have are actually um, deployment pipelines. Uh, and obviously, if something is failing in the build step, we don't want to push that image to production, I hope. Uh, but not everything that we do as DevOps engineers uh, or as DevOps professionals can be represented as a deployment pipeline. Uh, there are things that I do in my job every week, little things here and there that I need to do to keep my company running. Uh, and an easy way to document these is as a checklist. Pen on paper, Markdown, Trello, what have you. As long as you document them, you can accomplish these specific things at the start of the week or however, and that way other people can go in and they can redo the checklist again. So. Make checklists, that's the second one. And the final point is uh, called uniform communication. Uh, so believe it or not, no matter where a pilot is in the world, all pilots are required to speak English functionally, and we're also required to use uh, what we call standardized communication, a series of words or phrases so that when uh, other people are up in the skies listening to us, no matter who you are or where you are or what your level of familiarity with aviation is, when you say a specific phrase over the radio, everyone knows exactly what you're going to do. Now, we have documentation in software engineering, comments in code, wikis, readmes, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know about all of you, but a lot of mine is pretty fractured. Uh, some is comments, some is readmes, et cetera, et cetera. How can I expect someone that I'm trying to onboard to my specific project to understand what's going on if my documentation is so fragmented? 
Uh, so my advice would be to standardize that communication and standardize that documentation on a team level, if not an organizational level. And furthermore, try and restrict the use of acronyms. There was a time and a place where every single person in this room had no idea what AWS stood for. Uh, so by defining acronyms and trying to limit the use of them, uh, we make it easier for people to be onboarded to our projects and everything along those lines. So in short summary, make checklists as much as you possibly can for anything that you need to do more than once. Practice emergency procedures as often as you possibly can. Uh, and standardize your documentation and standardize your communication and hopefully your flights will be uh, as, or sorry, hopefully your deployments will be as safe as your flights. Uh, thanks for lending me your attention. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know about DevOps or about aviation. Thank you, Ryder. That's for you. You have to shake my hand or you don't get the chocolates. Thank you.